Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's workshop brought to you by the Center for Women's Leadership at the Forbes School of Business and Technology at University of Arizona Global Campus. We are excited to have with us today Dr. Maria Malader. She is a leading expert researcher and certified wellness practitioner. She creates new knowledge in her roles as professor of business psychology at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology and through her leadership development consulting practice. Dr. Malader is the founder of the Do What You Love Foundation, where she supports individuals in finding personal fulfillment through her speaking and workshops. She's the author of five books and often presents at various global conferences to build momentum for the wellness of leaders and organizations. She's worked in countless leadership and consulting roles in the corporate sector, military, and nonprofit organizations. We are honored and delighted to have her with us today, and it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Dr. Maria Malader. Well, good morning. Hi, and thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here, and just thank you for coming out this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the country. So, of course, we must start with a little wellness technique as we get ready to navigate through change. So first, <clears throat> I want you to, of course, sit up straight or stand up straight if you're at a standing desk. And I want to walk you through a very short breathing technique to get you focused. So think about whenever you've been around a baby and that they're crying excessively. And you know, they're really, they're, they're crying and they're going, <gasps> or some people kind of call it, uh, what is it? One of those ugly cries maybe, where they're going. <gasps> <gasps> so what we're going to do is a physiological sigh. So that's what you're going to do, is you're going to go. <gasps> 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 so go ahead and join me and go. <gasps> So what that physiological sigh is doing for you is it's giving you an opportunity to take a pause and get more oxygen to your brain. So now you can do this in any environment. So of course you don't want to maybe announce it that loudly, like, <gasps> but you can just go <sighs> or <sighs> just really quick to get more oxygen to your brain. And that's a really simple wellness technique for you. So maybe if something is triggering you or you just need to kind of pause in your day, you can take a short physiological pause. So there's your quick wellness technique on taking a pause to refocus. So there's one small wellness technique for you. So now I'm going to share some slides with you and talk a little bit more about wellness and what we're going to be doing this, um, this morning or afternoon. So we're going to be navigating the ride of change for wellness, and you're going to create a wellness, wellness or roadmap for wellness. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to talk about some change models. We're going to talk about wellness and change and help you create a map or a roadmap for wellness. Well, it wouldn't really be my style if I didn't give you homework. So you do have homework and you do have a worksheet. So I'm gonna ask Jenny now to go ahead and put in the chat a worksheet for this session. So if you're interested in participating with the worksheet for the session, it is located here and it'll be posted up in chat. And also one of the things as noted in my bio is it, I am in an ongoing process of participating in creating research studies about wellness and well being and well being in the workplace. So, I'm currently recruiting leaders to participate in a study if you'd want to participate in that. So, let me tell you a little bit about how I got involved in wellness. So, this has been a long journey for me. And frankly, it actually started in high school. So, I was a participant in junior achievement. Now, what is junior achievement? Junior achievement back in the day is it was, it's an organization that still exists today and it teaches business practices. And in high school, what we would do is we, go, we would go on site at corporations in the evening and they would teach us how to 
build a business and liquidate it in the semester. Well, in the Chicago area, what was really great is all these corporations would contribute and they would give us these leadership trainings. So at one of the leadership trainings, we saw these wonderful motivational speakers and they gave us leadership books about how to be great leaders. And one of the first books I received was called I Dare You. I don't know if anyone has writ, read that book before, but it's by William Danforth. And it was my first introduction to multidimensional wellness. And in that book, William Danforth talked about, in order to be the very best leader that you can be, is that you need to live a well-balanced life. And his perspective was taking a look at your mental health, your physical health, your intellectual health, and also your spiritual health. So that was my first introduction to looking at wellness or well-being and how it matched with being a great leader. Fast forward to college and I joined my sorority Alpha Sigma Alpha. In Alpha Sigma Alpha, part of the education program said the four aims of being a great leader is physical, intellectual, social, and spiritual development. So again, I'm learning how to be a great leader. I was part of the public health minor. And again, a new model came along for multidimensional wellness. And that expanded it even further to include other dimensions. And when I graduated college, I got involved further with a health and wellness training program working with the Navy. So along this whole journey, wellness seemed to capture me. And now even today working with research, so if anyone has ever heard of the New York bestseller called Callings by Greg Lavoie, he says in that book is, he, he would ask you the question is, what is the problem your life is supposed to solve? And so for me, the problem is how do I encourage people to look at wellness on a larger scale? So that's a little bit of the background of my story of how I got into wellness and how I think it is so important. So my, my hope is that you will take a different stand on wellness after this session. So moving forward, I wanna introduce our first acronym. We have two acronyms for today, and the first one is RIDE. So why RIDE is important for me is this was one of my dimensions of my own wellness is I build my wellness through bicycling. Now I have rid over, I've ridden over 5,700 miles. So for me, that's uh, probably about biking from Chicago to Colorado. And so I use this as one of my acronyms to remember that riding through change for me is part of my roadmap. And this roadmap is how do I risk, innovate, decide, and endure when I'm going through change. So when I'm risking, I want to have the ability to you know, take charge on the change. And I have these courageous conversations. Innovate, I'm willing to explore new ideas and territories and think creatively. I have to make a decision, what will I do? And then I have to endure through the change. And I wanted to give this to you right up front. So I'm giving you the preview of what I want you to take action or make decisions about at the end of the presentation. And you also have the preview of the homework and the worksheet along the way. So we're gonna ride through change. So now my next question for you, you can answer in the chat if you like, is how many people have ridden a bicycle before? So I'm wondering about that. So have you ridden a bicycle before? Because the reason I ask you that is I wonder if you have, maybe you need to think about rethinking about what you think about change because I know for myself, I've changed a lot from how I've evolved in riding my bicycle. See, I've had an elevation or evolution of my wheels. I mean, I started on a big wheel, you know, and then I elevated tricycle, different tricycles. I had a banana seat bike and I had a really fancy banana seat bike. I mean, mine had the leopard print and I was so sorry to give that up. It was just fancy. I mean, but I didn't have one of those bikes that had the streamers on it. But see, my point here is that sometimes we look at change in such a negative light, but the reality is, is that we're riding through change all the time. 
we are advancing in change. And for me, you know, these days I've got a hybrid bike and that's my fat tire bike. So I've evolved with my wheels and so have you. So we want to kind of keep that in mind when we're thinking about when we're resisting change, maybe we ought to rethink that, that we are changing along the way. But let's talk about why we don't like change. We like our current safe situation. We know it's going to take work to change. We might fail or we might lose face. It also disrupts our routine. And there's oftentimes a feeling, a loss or security. So there is a risk and it is difficult to change, you know, and we don't like it. But you know what we've learned is we have to change. So we really do have to change. And from a business perspective, we have to change because the World Economic Forum said, hey, these are the top 10 skills in 2015, complex problem solving, coordinating with other and people management as the top three. But when you shift over to 2020, you still have the problem solving, but two is critical thinking and three is creativity. So we have to change. So the skill sets are changing. So we do, we have to elevate and evolve in our wheels and we have to continually learn and change and realize that we are changing and we are evolving. And so, but we do realize it is difficult, but we have to stay in motion, but we have to change our paradigm. But there are some emotions that come along with changing uh, you know, the stages of change. So, and some of you have heard about this along the way. There are some emotional stages when we think about change and it can include a grieving process. It's the process of moving to a new normal. So initially when we're changing, of course, we're in denial. Then we resist, we, we're resisting. No way, I'm not gonna change, I'm not doing that. I'm just not, what are all the ways that I can resist it? What are all the ways I can kind of continue being the same and resist it? Then the change is pressuring upon us and we have to start exploring, you know, and, and, and say, okay, this change is not going away. What are the different ways I can be? What are the different ways I can be creative? How can I really start to move into this change? And then finally make a commitment for it. A lot of us have gone through this process. Wouldn't you agree? We've kind of been in the denial, resistance, exploration, and coming out of the commitment to get to that new normal. So there are some emotions with it. And some people, you, you know, you also want to think about the Kubler-Ross model of grieving too and thinking about that. And that's where you want to think about where sometimes you don't want to accept or maybe there's some anger that comes up and that's all natural part of the process. But just know that you're going to move through it. You have to explore and then make some commitments to change. There are emotions in it and you do need to take care of yourself in it. So now let's look at two different ways or processes for change that are really quite simple. And I know I am <clears throat> making them super simple. I know change can be hard. So Lewin has a simple change process and we can think of an ice cube possibly. First, you have to unfreeze. So you wanna examine the status quo. And when in the status quo, you want to look at what, how you can increase the driving forces for change and reduce the resisting forces. So when you're thinking about individual changes, like what's driving you forward in that change? And then what are some of the resistors? So when you're unfreezing a situation, think about what's helping you move it forward into that process. And then what could be holding you back? So that's when you're in that unfreeze process. Then you move, you take action, you make the change and you're involving people. And so that is the next stage. You're in the action process. You are making the change. You're trying the new things. You're trying on and seeing, you know, how does it fit uh, our organization? Does it fit in our systems? Is this really working? Does this process work? Trying out, adjusting, 
And then after trying new things and seeing what process does fit, then you go ahead and you refreeze and you make the changes permanent. And so you establish a new way of thinking and you reward the desired outcomes. So then you've completely made a change and you've refrozen the process and then you have a new way of being. Of course, change takes time. When we think about our own individual behaviors, there's a lot of research that says initial behavior change, of course, takes between for it to stick 21 to 28 days. And that's just for an individual. When you think about organizations, that process is certainly a longer process. Last night, I was in a panel discussion and they were thinking a project was going to take three months. And it's really almost a year and a half now. So there's so many different dynamics because you really have to look at when you're thinking of organizations, you're thinking about there's people in those processes and people are wondering about how does it affect me? So you have so many different kind of dynamics there. So when we think about Lewin's, the simple steps are how do I unfreeze? How do I move? And then how do I refreeze? So then we think about another model. I picked the simple ones. Moving through change and bridges transition theory. So we want to think about some of the emotions with this as we transition. So we will have an ending. It's saying goodbye. It's letting go. And sometimes you're losing an identity. So when there's a merger and acquisition, one of the organizations has to lose some of their identity. So they're, they're thinking of it that way. So there has to be some ending in there. So a loss of identity or, or maybe you're making a certain change around your wellness and you know that changes not only how you're behaving, but it could change who you're hanging out with. So that's, you know, that could be an ending and those are difficult. Then you move into the neutral zone and you spend some time here and it's uncomfortable. You know, when you're exploring, similar like to the other model, you're exploring and seeing, you know, what does this look like? How can I become this new person? You know, what are my avenues for transitioning? And also exploring the emotions, like what does the new me look like? Or what does the new organization look like? You know, still trying on new ways of being, exploring avenues, what works, what doesn't work. And then you move forward and you have new beginnings. And this is relying on regular and effective communication. And you have to then see and wait how other people cope because then there'll be a response to the change. So if you are um, personally making changes that could impact others, uh, they have to adjust to the new way the organization operates or the new way that you're going to interact with them. Uh, those are all changes. You know, I mean, I know I'm thinking a little bit about myself and, and I'm a, a bit of a transition myself is uh, of my group of friends. I'm the one who's back in the office. So we went back in the office in August and so that is a different, uh, it, it's a transition because a lot of my uh, friends are still working from home. So things that we had patternized uh, as far as how we kept connected and everything it has changed. So we have to kind of change our relationships and connections because that won't work for me anymore because, uh, you know, I'm in, well, I'm in my commuting and then I'm also in the office. So those are kind of dynamics that shifted in my relationship. And then also, frankly, frankly, my energy level is a little different too in my time with the commuting. So those are kind of transitions that kind of ripple out in a little bit of a change, you know, and also a change that also happens not only for the people that are kind of on the home front, but then also the transitions we experience when we come back to the office, you know, and those kind of transitions of, I guess, when we're speaking about the changes of where we had meetings, where we would always in the past, we would always have our meetings where we would eat lunch together. 
at, and have our meetings and that had to transition too, you know, for safety reasons. So it's just kind of interesting about, you know, walking through this endings, a neutral zone and moving forward and just adapting to what is the new normal. So you create new ways on how you interact, new ways and new systems and process. So again, the transition process is just changing the identity of the situation with an ending. You have an exploration phase, like how do we make this work now? And then the new beginnings, how do you move into that new stage of this change? So these changes shift our identity. So we have to re-identify invent our identity, you know, if we're individually, and then also with organizations and with our leadership teams. So there's a lot going on right now with reinventing our identity. So we think we want to go back to old ways. And there are elements of old ways we can go back to. But when we're talking about our wellness, we want to think about where do we want to be? Who do we want to be? Where is our wellness right now? And, and think about what is our identity about our wellness? You know, the change shift shifts our perspective too. Uh, we have a lot of new outlooks. You know, uh, things I may have thought of the past don't fit anymore, or I, I have a lot of new ideas. I think everybody's had a lot of new ideas because there've been so many disruptions. Uh, both, uh, there's, uh, last night, the panel of speakers I was listening to or part of was on change management, and one woman walked in and she said, this is the greatest disruption we've ever had because it's an opportunity for us to change everything. And that was her perspective. And it, it is, it's interesting, like this is the time to make a lot of change. And so, because there's, uh, it's almost like it's a snow globe that's shaken up and there's snow all over the place. So we have a lot we can do right now. So think about what has changed for you in the past years. And I will challenge you to ask is maybe we do like change after all. And I'll ask you this question. Do you eat everything? Do you eat the same thing every night for dinner or lunch? Do you wear the same clothes every day? Do you go to the same place when you travel for a vacation? Maybe we do like change. So that's a question I have for you. And it, it's a little bit of a disruption. So maybe there are changes that we do like. So let me show you an example of maybe a change that we do like. How about that? Phones. Phones have certainly changed. That's an old, old TV. Old, old. That certainly is not a flat screen. <laughs> I wonder how much that weighs. So typewriter, there you have it. So compared to our very flat and thin laptops. So, uh, you know, we have really evolved with a lot of change. And then there we have it. We do have a... Uh, we do have a turntable there, but you know it's very interesting because turntables are coming back. And so that's very interesting. How we listen to music has really evolved from the digital formats and now cycling back to turntables. So we have a lot of change that has occurred and that we have adapted and that we have wanted to adapt to. So you're better at change than you think you are, right? So that's kind of an interesting thing to think about. And what I found most interesting in thinking about change is I appreciate one of the cartoons that I watched when I was growing up. And I so appreciated their forward thinking because they predicted a lot of what we have today. Welcome to the Jetsons, okay? They were on from 1962 to 1988. And as you can see, they already had an Apple watch. Uh, they were already doing Zoom communications. They had a Roomba, <laughs> and then they were doing, you know, Facebook Messenger over there. So I was so impressed with how advanced the Jetsons were in predicting what we have here in 2021. So they were ready for the change. Now, I I am disappointed that we don't have the flying cars yet that they had in this cartoon, but I am impressed that they did predict pretty much 
in this in in 1962 to 88 some of the things and the technology that we have today so we did adapt well i think the apple watch is just so fascinating to me so now let's uh think about some of the paradigms as we move from change and getting ready to move and think about wellness further. So uh, thinking about the industry of wellness is very interesting. And the term wellness itself can be kind of confusing. So the first thing maybe when you think about wellness is physical health, I, I would guess. So, and it is confusing out in the marketplace. So this is a study from McKinsey. I love and appreciate the, that consulting for, uh, forum. So the wellness market, feeling good industry, is a $1.5 trillion market. Okay, so they did a study of 7,500 people in six different countries, and this is what they saw as consumer views of wellness across six dimensions. They saw better health, fitness, nutrition, appearance, sleep, and mindfulness. So this is what's driving the $1.5 trillion market of wellness. I think it's fascinating. I think that we've learned though, that you know there is a little bit more than these areas for wellness. So I said, well, <laughs> well, because there's probably more topics you would add to those categories. So ta-da, I'd like to introduce to you, as I said before, a wider view of wellness that I'd like to consider for yourself. Multidimensional wellness. This is my favorite categorization of multidimensional wellness. So as you already saw, if you pulled down the handout, you have physical, occupational, spiritual, social, um, intellectual, and emotional. So if you have felt disruptions in the pandemic and felt like you've been off balance, you've had a disruption in your wellness. You really have. And it has been probably in one of these areas or two or three. So this is, uh, these concepts or this multidimensional wellness is not new business. This is not a new model. Uh, Halbert Dunn in 1959 put an official model of, uh, he was a doctor and he put together an official model of what was considered high level wellness. And he started to put together these many dimensions of wellness and said that what he saw in his patients of people that had high level wellness had several dimensions or areas of wellness going on in their life. Several categories in their life were in place where they demonstrated high levels of wellness. So it was beyond just the physical aspect of it. There were other areas that were elevated in their life or that were uh, going well for them. So this is a six dimensions of wellness. So from Halbert Dunn, there were other doctors and other different associations that move forward. And this model is designed from uh, Dr. Bill Hetler, and he was at University of Stevens Point in Wisconsin, and he put together this model, and he also started what is called the National Wellness Institute, and so out of that group, they are promoting worksite wellness and just educating more people about how multidimensional wellness is important, and that organizations should look at the lens of multidimensional wellness for leaders and employees, and that this these are the categories to consider. Now, there are additional models that add environmental and financial, So, but these are the baseline aspects that I'm always thinking about if I'm feeling out of balance. And there's several different books that also kind of play into certain categories of how do you be a great leader and have these dimensions of wellness. So let's define them a little bit further. So when you're thinking about physical, these are kind of the easy ones to think about. So you're thinking about regular exercise and your nutritional health and your self-care, monitoring your vital signs, um, taking a look at what you're doing with alcohol and drug use uh, and connection possibly to nature too. Uh, occupational, uh, 
thinking about how you, it's not necessarily just about work. It's just how are you using your talents and your strengths? So that also could be in volunteer work where you're feeling a sense of achievement. So that's where you'll see people that they'll say they're retired, but they're super busy and they're doing other things. They're still using their talents and gifts. Uh, social aspect is having positive connections, uh, receiving social support, uh, being engaged with others in your life. The spiritual aspect is having a sense of purpose, uh, connecting to a higher power, awareness of life, intellectual is creativity and having stimula stimulating mental activity, reading, staying current on topics you enjoy, and emotional is acceptance of your feelings, management of your emotions and management of stress. So this is a wider picture of the dimensions of wellness and a consideration of maybe where you maybe felt off kilter or maybe some areas that I'd like you to think about where you could ride through change and think about your wellness. So I tend to think of acronyms to try and help me. And so I put together a new uh, acronym and I put posse together. So what's your posse? So posse is actually a word in the dictionary and posse with spelled this way is not your tribe, but posse spelled specifically with the I E is actually your place or your position. So I want you to think about what is your place or position on wellness? So, so where are you at? So maybe you can put that in the chat. Where are you at with your posse for wellness? So where are you at physically? Where are you at occupationally, socially, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally? What is your place in wellness? I'm not saying you're going to be balanced all the time because you're not. You know, every time they say, oh, you, you got to be balanced in life. You're not going to be balanced in life. So, but I want you to think about these areas and where are you at and what are you thinking about or where, you know, forward thinking, of course, I'm asking you to do some homework. What else could you be thinking about, about your physical health, about occupational work or volunteerism, social, something you could do there, spiritual, intellectual, or emotional. So that's something to consider. What's your posse? So. So I can give you all these theories and, and say, okay, I want you to ride through change. I want you to think about what your posse is, but how does it really work in real life? And while I tell you this, do I practice this? You know, you have a lot of people that'll stand up and they'll give talks and you think about, do they walk the talk? Maybe you're asking that, do I walk the talk? Well, I'm certainly not uh, an Olympic runner or anything like that, or everything is not perfect for me, but I do want to tell you a story. So I want to tell you a story and I'll put this up and I want to tell you about how these wellness principles have worked for me. So first I told you the story about how I first got aligned with these wellness principles, but now I want to tell you about how it worked for me. So the year was 2010. And boy, I was just having an awesome career and things are really, really looking up for me. And I was director of a center for positive aging. It was really awesome. Uh, some of my doctoral research was about the transition into retirement. And of course, I looked at, you know, life planning and wellness principles and how people prepared for retirement, you know, and what were they up to and what were the secrets to retirement. And so I was overseeing a positive center for positive aging, and we were having this awesome conference, an, uh, a national conference on positive aging, you know, inviting all these great speakers. And I was all jazzed about that. And I was speaking at the American Society on Aging, and I was getting all ready for that. And I was getting ready to go downtown. Well, and I was driving, and lo and behold, I rear ended somebody. So I got in a car accident like the day before I was supposed to give a big talk at the American Society on Aging. So yeah, I didn't think too much of it, whatever, I wasn't paying attention, I rear-ended somebody. But then after that, I, for some reason, life started to speed up. It was just so interesting. I felt like my life was on fast forward and I couldn't sleep. 
And then my personality started to change. And then what I was thinking in my mind automatically slipped out of my mouth. Uh, so I was in the store and I saw someone's outfit. Um, and I was like, oh man, lady, that was just a great outfit. Or, uh, or someone, you know, cut in line uh, of me. And I was like, oh, you know, gosh, that was so mean of you. And things were just flying out of my mouth. And someone said, gosh, Maria, what's wrong with you? Well, what had happened in the car accident? Now, mind you, I didn't hit anything, but what had happened is from the jolt of the car accident, I actually, my brain crashed ahead against the front of my skull. And so what I had is a traumatic brain injury. I didn't have any idea. So my whole personality changed and a lot of things changed. And it was a very scary time. And so I had a frontal lobe injury. And what comes with that is that I was losing my executive function. And I also lost my short-term memory. So that means that I would go to the mall and I wouldn't remember where my car was. Or that means that uh, I, uh, I would read something and I wouldn't remember it. So how was I going to continue on? So I had to, um, it was a very scary time for me. I actually had to stop working. So uh, I, it, it was just super scary. And so I had to stop working and I was out of work for about a year and a half. And I just didn't, I, I had to figure out what am I going to do here? I had to figure out how I was going to recover. And so it was a very scary time. So, I mean, luckily, you know, I do care about wellness and I had these wellness principles and I was very lucky because of this wellness journey that I had a primary care physician and that I knew a lot of people in the industry to be able to connect and get to the right people to help me even identify that I had traumatic brain injury. So that was kind of the start. And then to go through the journey of figuring out how do you heal from a traumatic brain injury. That's how I ended up, you know, I mean, doing all the neuropsych tests and then all the kind of spec scans and everything to see what aspects of my brain was not functioning anymore. So very scary time going through that and losing my job and identity and not really knowing if I could ever really work again. And so luckily by kind of pulling together, uh, I felt very blessed to be able to pull together different resources and medical team to help me uh, pull through, uh, pull through in a way that they gave me a lot of different alternative ways to kind of heal and to use these wellness principles along the way. So first, you know, I had to figure out how I was going to reinvent my identity because for certain, I didn't think I could be a professor anymore because at the time I couldn't read. I mean, I could read, but I couldn't retain anything. So, you know, I had to, um, you know, work with uh, learning about how the brain functions and how do you heal and learn about the neuroplasticity of that. Uh, I had to get the self-determination and build up my support network of who was going to be on my team because I didn't have the social support of work anymore. Like, how did I create community around me to help me, you know, and beyond the kind of the physical medical aspects of that, you know, who else in the holistic or integrative medicine field could help me heal from this brain injury? So I did. I took this wellness wheel and started to work it with my team. Uh, so we changed my brain with art, music, nutrition, and career. So one of the very first things that was super helpful, I mean, I know this is probably not the best thing, but one of my friends said, you should get on your bike of course, with a big helmet, okay, <laughs> to be very protective, but to get in the cycle of waking up every single morning to get on my bicycle. And that's why, how I rode through change is every morning I got up and went on my bike for 10 minutes. I, I rode through the snow too, because it was, it gave me purpose. So that's how I got to over 5,700 miles, you know, uh, of tracking on my bike. Then there was music, okay. I didn't take music. I didn't know how to play an instrument. But this guy at church, the choir director said, look, I know you're not working. You're not teaching night classes now. Why don't you join the church choir? We need people. 
I'm thinking, look, I'm only a car singer. I do perfect car solos. And, and so I char- joined the church choir. And you know what? I sucked. <laughs> No one wanted to sit by me, so I was so terrible. But anyway, after a couple of months, what happened is the music, uh, you know, singing music crosses two hemispheres of your brain. And so I was able to start recovering my memory because the two hemispheres of my brain were crossing. And so I went to the neuropsychiatrist and I came in and uh, the car accident happened in March and it was in, I started singing in August in November. I came to the session and I said, Hey, you know, I was singing some of the lyrics of the song and he's like, Hey, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, I can. You know, like, I think it was, you know, it was November. We started Christmas songs, you know, and we were singing, um, you know, Oh, come, Oh, come Emmanuel. And, uh, I was singing and he said, you can't do that. And I said, yes, I can. And he goes, Oh my goodness, your singing is healing your brain. And so uh, I continued to sing and I changed my nutrition and I started to eat brain healthy foods. And then we started, you know, I started to see improvement of doing all the right things to start healing my brain. So I guess on the next slide, I have a little more details of how that worked. So physically, there was nutrition choices, exercise and sleep, and sleep is totally important. Really, you have to get a lot of sleep. Um, You may think you only need a couple hours, but really for your brain, you need a lot. Occupationally, I started, you know, I worked with a career coach. I did informational interviewing. I wasn't sure if I could ever become a professor again. So, I, I mean, I, I did do something, I did get back to something else, but I did something else um, before coming into my current job. Um, socially, I started volunteering, spent more time with family and friends, spiritual, looking for meaning and purpose in church, intellectually learning to sing. I didn't know how to read music. I was a car singer. Uh, church, um, and then emotional journaling and working with a behavioral coach. And, you know, I, I mean, there was a lot of anger, being frustrated and everything moving through that and obviously losing my ability to read and everything that was really hard. And then environmental, that's another aspect you can add is just changes to make life easier. So that was my posse plan. So you can have a posse plan too. And I encourage you to do that and think about what are the different ways that you can shift your life to have better wellness. And as leaders, you need wellness. My goodness, you're a leader. You're doing something great. So you want to consider how you can be well and be great. You want to encourage others to also pay attention to their wellness too, because we've learned a lot about wellness in the pandemic. So, so that was the summary of what I did. And by the way, I did fully heat, uh, recover from the traumatic brain, brain injury. I did get back to work. And then I did... And I've been, uh, I did get an opportunity. I did work um, in corporate for a while. And then I started a speaking business and I worked with the Do What You Love Foundation, helping other people as they recover from brain injuries. And I still do that. And then I am also a professor again. So I'm very happy to be back in that role. So, and I'm happy that I've recovered being able to read again. So that was very happy. Uh, happy time for me. So let's kind of move forward. And I will talk about, you know, uh, talking a little bit about the pandemic and wellness and change. Now, I know we've experienced a lot of wellness and change. And I added this photo, like, this is downtown Chicago. And this is something that is um, unique, because this is during a weekday, and usually it's more full of cars. So you want to take a pause for a second of what changed for you. You know, I mean, I had those big changes with that brain injury. And then, you know, I healed. But I mean, things changed for me in the pandemic. And so did my wellness. And I need it. I do need a reset. And I mean, because that car accident was in 2010. And here we are in 2021. So a little bit of a change. I know that was a little bit of a jump to this picture, but I want you to think about you now, about the pandemic and your own wellness changes. But there's also been some good things. So for me, now where I'm at, um, you know, I I want you to think about how you can kind of continue to ride through the pandemic, 
Um, you know, maybe you need to get on your bike or whatever you need to do for your own wellness because you do have the ability to change and that you have ridden through change before. And we are getting through this pandemic. And as leaders, taking care of yourself is really, really important. And there are positives ahead. So I wanna share with you some of the positives and ways that I've been moving through the pandemic and riding through using these models. There are new posse adventures ahead. So I'm not sure how many of you got a pandemic puppy. So I joined the Pandemic Puppy Club. And so this is my pandemic puppy. Her name is Juliet. And uh, yeah, she does have a wardrobe, <laughs> a little bit of a wardrobe. But anyway, this was one of the new posse adventures ahead for me. Um, and it brings joy. And so it's just a matter of, well, we we're still in this change dynamic of a pandemic. Um, for me, this was a little bit of a... Um, a social shift for me because she has a fan club in the neighborhood. So uh, the kids adore her and they call it the Juju B fan club. So they all rally around her as she's grown up. So she's 11 months now and they just gather. And so that's kind of another way that I'm kind of leading people in wellness for the social development around one thing. And then also a little bit of an uh, intellectual development too, as the kids are watching her evolve in growing up. So little bit of a jump, but let me share with you how I've kind of revised my posse plan. So giving you examples about walking the talk. So I will admit that there have been challenges for myself in the pandemic, and I've had to adjust my plans. So I am focused on my own brain health. And so I want to tell you what my brain or my brain health plan is right now. And I'm focused on building joy. There is a lot of negativity going on, and I was getting in a circle of negativity myself. So I needed to get out of that cycle. So I'm focused on joy, and I'm interested in building joy chemistry. So with some assistance of um, some neuroscientists that I'm working with, we are working on building joy chemistry. So I'll be working on some research with that in the future. So this is my revision to my posse plan and building joy chemistry. So... I'm trying to do this every day, but it is a tall order. 10 minutes of meditation, 30 minutes of exercise, 30 minutes of making music. That could be just banging on a drum or singing, something where I'm in the activity of making music, so I'm crossing the hemispheres of my brain, and 30 minutes of creating. So I'm not saying I'm a great artist. I love photography. Could be art journaling, creating, could be cooking. So it's a way to kind of build the chemistry in your brain to kind of elevate your mood. So that's how I'm working on uh, joy chemistry. And then I'm also working on doing deep emotional checks. I'm working on gratitude and attitude checks when I'm at work, because sometimes I could get like eh, 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 a little negative. And so I just have to realize that I'm grateful and I work on my own attitude checks and work on the awareness. And then I'm also working on reconnecting and rebuilding relationships. Plus, I mean, it's a tall order. It's not always going on at the same time. I'm targeting at the seven to eight hours of sleep because I have really noticed makes a big difference. I am doing zero artificial sweeteners because the minute I took that out of my cycle, I don't have headaches. I'm doing nutrition checks, physical checks, and actually posture checks. So if you are working from home, I encourage you to make sure that you're paying attention to your posture because you could be throwing your spine off a little bit. So this is my joy chemistry plan that I have now as I've moved through change from the pandemic. So I'm in the game not perfect, but in the game, and I'm working on the process of this multidimensional wellness. So my question to you now is, of course, what's your posse, but are you ready to move forward? So are you ready to ride through change? Are you ready to ask yourself what, what you want to do for your posse? So what is your posse? What's your place in wellness? Where are you physically, occupationally, socially, spiritually, intellectually, emotionally, what's your posse? And how will you ride through the or through change? How will you risk 
How will you innovate? How will you decide and endure? So that's my ask for you. So this would be a time maybe you want to, you know, complete your action plan or put in the chat maybe some ideas of what action you may take for your plan. So, so that can stir some ideas from people. You know, what would be some of your action plans or personal wellness topics? I mean, it could be as easy as that you're going to look something up on the web or you're going to reach out and call somebody or set an appointment to get a physical with your primary care physician. Or maybe you're going to sing today or bang a drum. Lots of choices. See, I gave you a lot of opportunities. See, wellness is so much wider than what we've been sold, right? It's so much fun, right? It's a wider scope. So we're, we're really shamed into a lot of wellness and it's so much more beautiful and wider. And then if you need ideas, you know, I was just in Walgreens yesterday and the National Geographic has a copy of the Blue Zones. And that is, that is a issue that talks about the seven or eight places in the world where, mo where people live, the most people live to 100. And so that tells and defines how and why they have the greatest longevity. And so a lot of those concepts are actually wellness concepts that you're, they're util utilizing. And it's really great to kind of learn about, you know, who and how they're doing that. So kind of wrapping up a little bit, the ride of change is you endure change all the time. And remember your posse and adjust accordingly and take the ride for wellness for yourself and others. And so that's really, really important to just realize and change your paradigm that you are changing all the time and that take a look at your posse and adjust accordingly and take that ride, get on your bike or whatever you do, you know, and make a change and a stand for yourself because you are important as leaders. You make a difference and everybody's a leader. You make a difference and you matter. So I, I am continuing my research on this. I'm gonna move forward and work with educating more people about Posse and doing some more research in the spring. I have a couple of studies as far as I'm working on um, learning more about well-being connected to leadership. And so you're welcome to participate in any of the studies. I have a short survey to ask, um, you know, if you're going to take change. So Jenny, if you could put that um, link up in the quiz and also to ask if you wanna participate in any future studies. We have a lot of our students participating in wellness studies right now at our campus. So you can participate, like take surveys, but also I may be doing some classes on this. Uh, so this is also, if you wanna learn more about my stuff, not study my story of how I move through, a recovering from the brain injury. This is the specific book that I wrote about, and it details a little bit more about the story. So I thank you. And I guess we can, I can look or someone can help me with answering some questions. Uh, let's see. And these are the links for the surveys, but I think, Jenny, if you put them in the chat. So uh, survey of the event and research, worksheet for the sessions, um, participate in a well-being study. And so I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much for coming. And I, my hope is that you're going to take action for your wellness because you deserve it. And that uh, I wish you well on your posse and that you're going to ride through change. Thank you so much, Maria. That was amazing. I'm Carissa and I'll be filtering some of the questions. We have lots of questions. So I'm going to try to cover as many as I can. We only have a few minutes. Uh, the one, the first one I got was, how do you keep yourself motivated? How do you stay committed to the path once you kind of get on it? How, how what's your technique for that? <laughs> um, I try and have an accountability partner. Mm. So I think that's really important. Like I, you know, in my most recent movement with this joy chemistry is I'm trying to start joy chemistry circles. 
So, or for when I was working with the brain injury, um, when I had that car accident, the person who was working with me with the choir, he rode his bike. So he was always like, did you ride? So I think having an accountability partner is really important. So that's one part. And then I also, I also believe in affirmations and I am known to put things on my mirror. So I'll put it a note on my mirror. I mean, it's nice to have a really pretty house, but it's also nice to have an affirmation to say, go and do it. <laughs> I'm so glad you said that. I need to do that too. Um, let me see what else we had. Um, how do you remain authentic when you're committed to staying on this path? That was one of the questions. Like, how do you really remain authentic to yourself and become authentic to other people while you're on the, the path to wellness? So it's super hard. Because I mean, it's super hard. Sometimes I will find myself um, uh, like I really don't drink. I mean, I can't because of the brain injury. So, so I have to, I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Sometimes I'll get a Sprite and I'll put a lemon in it. So it looks like a drink. So sometimes I play the game. Sometimes I'll get a cranberry juice or something like that. And then sometimes I, I just say I prefer water. So it is hard. It's a careful dance because there's so much pressure. So, yeah. and I also just have to forgive myself. Like I'm not supposed to eat fast food. Okay. That's part of the rules, but you know what? I had chicken nuggets yesterday, so I have to forgive myself <laughs> Yeah, and with barbecue sauce, by the way. <laughs> so there you have it. <laughs> yeah, we're human. We, we're going to do that. Um, I had a couple of questions about how to find the models that were in the PowerPoint. Do you have them? Some One specific one was, what was the name of the grievance model that you shared? Um, you know, I'll have to, I mean, part of that is Kubler-Ross. Mm -hmm. And so I just can't remember exactly where I ended up getting that um, drawing. But that is part of the Kubler-Ross model. Perfect. So, okay. Let me see what else we have. Yeah, your presentation was great. Um, thank you so much. Um, and then we have like three minutes. Let me see. We have a bunch of questions on here. Um, so how do you, one question I had wrote down from Facebook was, how do you, her, her husband was always in denial and you mentioned denial. And how do you handle someone that is constantly in denial when you're trying to make changes yourself around them. Does that make sense? Trying to sum it up. <laughs> so you can't change anybody. So that's the, that's the hardest part. And so it's just how you respond to that. That's the hardest thing is how you change your own attitude toward that. Cause I have people in my life that are in denial and I have to care for my own attitude. So that is, that's the hardest part about the denial. Cause I've been going through that with someone important in my life and I have to shift my attitude, so but it's good. hard. Okay. We have another question and then we'll have to wrap it up. Um, oh, there's a lot of questions that I didn't yes. answer. So, so the book about my brain injury <laughs> is uh, navigating the ride of change. Um, so I'm trying to see, let's see, there were a lot of different questions. Let's see. Um, um, trying to pick out some and then Brandy will have to. Can we still pull the questions? Yeah, one I of the, I'll pop in here. So one of the questions is, what is the name of the grievance model that you mentioned? Yeah, so I, I mean, I still link that to Kubler-Ross. So just the Kubler-Ross on grieving. So that was kind of a piece of it. I just can't remember where I got the graphic. That's all right. And someone else asked where you got your SPECT scans. Oh, okay. I got the SPECT scans in, I'm in the suburbs. And so I got the SPECT scans in Skokie, Illinois, and I can't remember the location. And then I'm in a brain to behavior program in Romeoville, um, Illinois, and it's called the Institute for Personal Development. Now they don't do spec scans, but they do QEEGs. So in, if you wanted a little more details on that, I do know that Dr. Daniel Amen has Amen clinics all over the place, but I have not associated with him, 
like his group, but he is also a strong proponent of spec scans. And then Diane asks us, how do you actually get to the taking the risk part? <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I t take little risks first. Like I try a different food. I take small risks first to get used to taking risks. Cause I was a very scared person when I was young. So it was small risks. You can also challenge yourself. Sometimes when you learn in negotiation classes is you have to get used to hearing no. So we had an assignment and it was called collecting no's. And so it was just a way to kind of challenge yourself to stretch, to get no's. So it was another way to kind of learn how to, I guess, as an example of how do you take risks, take small risks first, feel the fear and do it anyway. And I think a book that you can look at is called Hello Fears. I just heard that author speak. And so that I can't remember her name, but her book is called Hello Fears. Thanks, well, Maria. Yes, yes. Thank thank you. turn it over to Brandy. Thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you, guys. And thank you so much. A huge thank you to Dr. Maria Malater. This was a phenomenal uh, presentation today, and we are so, so grateful to you for spending your time uh, with us. I know that uh, we've all got some very valuable takeaways uh, today. And just before we close, I do want to remind folks that we do have one more uh, event coming up this month. It is coming up on December 9th. I know we have a lot of graduate and doctoral students here with us today. So this is gonna be perfect for you guys. Um, we're gonna have Dr. Peggy Sundstrom and Dr. Mary Saunders uh, leading the community chat. And the focus is going to be uh, for students in graduate and doctoral programs, what are your challenges and support systems? So we encourage you uh, to attend that session. And as always with our uh, community chats, be sure that you come ready to uh, participate and engage because they are very interactive events. Um, and so thank you guys so much for attending uh, today. And you'll notice in the chat, Jenny's posted a link where you can go to register for all of our CWL events and find the CWL survey. Again, thank you to everyone and have a wonderful day. Thanks so much, Maria. If you'll stick around for just a moment, I'm going to pass over uh, to Rebecca to take us down from Facebook Live. Okay, great. Well, Maria, what a wonderful session. Thank you so much for joining us. I did have a question for you. Um, I'm assuming that a lot of what you presented today was original research. Is the posse model yours? I just made it up the other day. It's fabulous. I mean, I mean, the term posse. I mean, I just took theirs and I put that together. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> It's terrific, though. I mean, I could see this being a really cool poster or graphic. I mean, just having visually seen some of these reminders, like the one on posture, I just, you know, it sat up straight, it made me think. Um, just those reminders, I think, are so super helpful. I could see some great products coming out of that. I, I need the encouragement because I just, I love this model. I mean, and I really, people need it. I mean, thank you so much. I was talking with someone who is a speaker with me and he wasn't sure Posse would hit right, but I think it's okay. <laughs> I think it's okay. Yeah, so. I mean, at Posse, I, I, I could see maybe some argument for a negative connotation or like a slang or maybe cultural misappropriation, people who, um, you know, take that very seriously. But I, I mean, personally don't see an issue with it. I'm just externally processing why someone would take issue with it. And I, I don't think it's a severe concern. 
He was, he was more as that it was too many letters. Ah, it was too okay. many letters, but I, I mean, I would love to chat with you to help me with the product or something like that. Cause I, I need, I, I need some guidance cause I need to move this out because, yeah. cause I do because because when I saw when I saw the McKinsey study, and I just saw that about a week ago, I'm I'm thinking, oh my gosh, no one understands wellness. Mm -hmm. They do. I mean, no one understands it. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I'd love to chat with you. When I was um, uh, the director for our Najafi Global Mindset Institute at Thunderbird, we created all kinds of really cool products around what was our global mindset model. So we had, you know, um, cards like for activities and training sessions, we had posters, we had workbooks, I mean, all kinds of just really cool little things that people seem to really enjoy. And, you know, we didn't advertise it widely, but we used it in all of our consulting engagements and trainings. And, you know, people just loved having something that, that they could hold on to. I totally would love to get a conversation with you on how I could do that because I want to do that. I mean, I feel like, you know, I told the story at the beginning of how the model captured me when I was in high school. I mean, it's a life mission. It is. I mean, it's a life mission. Did I do okay with telling my brain injury oh, story? You did you did great? I mean, I I was waiting for it with like bated breath because I knew your background. You know, I think it's it's really punchy to start off with that too because I think so many people when you started sharing that started putting things in the chat about their own experiences and you know just having like a visceral reaction to wow your whole life was turned upside down and i think that takes wellness to a whole other level when we're thinking about that you know it's not just um you know something small it's like your whole life is disrupted so it's powerful <laughs> no you did that, great. you did great and i don't want to take up too much of your time because it sounds like you've been back to back presentations this it's, week it's, I mean, and we, we have our teaching weekend, you know, this weekend, but I mean, we're, they're finishing, they're doing presentations. I was just so happy to do this because it was perfect timing for me. And this brain to behavior program is so interesting that I'm in because, you know, I, my joy chemistry got off and so they're helping me. <laughs> so that is my homework. They're like meditation, singing. Yeah. <laughs> That's what they told me. So well, it's so funny. Yeah, no, that's terrific. And um, you and I will definitely catch up um, on the side. So feel yeah, free to send I'll me totally. over a calendar well, Thank you so much for having me. It's such yeah. an honor and I love your work. And I just, I'm so glad that we met a couple of years ago. I just appreciate you. So likewise. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, you have a great day and we will see you later. Thanks everyone who stuck okay. around. We'll okay. see you at thank the next you event. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay, bye.